I'm uh, glad to uh, open the uh, afternoon session um, dealing uh, with uh, the topic of constitutions in Muslim countries. Uh, and I think that uh, this uh, panel is uh, neatly connected to the previous one which uh, dealt with, uh, democ with democracy and Islam. Um, I'll say a few uh, things to begin. Um, the academic discussion uh, on the compatibility between Islam and democracy uh, has a long history. <coughs> Apparently, uh, we have here two perceptions of sovereignty. In democracy, the common will of the people through their elected representatives is sovereign. In Islam, the sovereign is God and his will is represented in his law the Sharia. The tension between these two perceptions of sovereignty is reflected in Islamist writings. In the writings of Islamist figures such as Yusuf al-Karadawi and Hassan Turabi, there is an assumption that the majority of Muslim people desire the application of the Sharia, and therefore the common will of the people is willingly uh, submissive to the, sovereign, to the sovereignty of God. The history of constitutions in the Muslim world goes back to the first Ottoman constitution of 1876. The text of constitutions is often general enough to serve as a forum around which the general public can debate the nation's cultural, political, social, and moral vision. In many Muslim countries, the constitution expresses a commitment that the principles of Islamic law are the main source of legislation, such as in the uh, famous Article 2 of the Egyptian Constitution. At the same time, the Constitution presents a commitment to defend democratic and liberal values and human rights. <coughs> the fact that the text of the Constitution is often so general should bring us uh, to realize that the meaning given to constitutional texts by political and judicial organs uh, that have the authority to interpret it is what really matters in practice and deserves a close investigation. The dialogue between these organs and various political factions is also very important. During the last decade, uh, we witnessed a number of attempts by the West, especially the United States, after its occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan to assist liberal local elements in designing constitutions that represent the expected change of orientation uh, by those countries. Furthermore, the popular call uh, for further democratization of political processes, which stood in the center of the Arab Spring, highlights the renewed discussion of constitutional texts. A representative example is the first debate in Egypt about the text of the 2012 new constitution, which signals, at least in terms of its text, a slight shift in the direction of Islamist political parties. Um, I'm certain that we are going to uh, learn more uh, about this dynamic development uh, from the distinguished speakers of this panel and I'm looking forward to interesting presentations and following discussion. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Professor Nathan Brown. Uh, professor Brown uh, is professor of political science and in international affairs at George Washington University. He's also a non-resident senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, he's the author uh, of five books on Arab politics, with the most recent, When Victory is Not an Option, Islamist Movements in Arab Politics, by Cornell University Press, uh, 2012. Uh, Professor Brown has also edited three books and authored articles in important journals. He has served as a Fulbright Scholar in Egypt, Israel, and the Gulf, as well as a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington. 
Professor Brown has served as a Carnegie Scholar between uh, 2009 and 11, and was named uh, as a Guggenheim Fellow, a fellow in uh, 2013. He is President-elect of the Middle East Studies Association, and uh, the topic of uh, his talk is, Can Egypt Re Reconstitute Itself? Please. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Ron. I uh, begin just by explaining a little bit about my interest in the subject of constitutions in Arab states. I um, had finished up a research project, this was about 20 years ago, and was wondering what to do next when I spoke to a colleague of mine who was interested in, he spent most of his scholarly career f uh, focused on the international legal regime governing Antarctica. And I asked him, how did you pick the subject of international law of Antarctica? And he said, oh, it's very, very simple. Um, even if I did it badly, I knew I would be top in my field. And it was with that same kind of spirit that I decided to go into uh, Arab constitutional law. Um, and my interest, my, my goal succeeded actually very, very quickly. I wrote a book on Arab constitutional law, which was reviewed, I am very proud to say, by one reviewer who described it as the best book in English on the subject. At the time, the reviewer failed to note that it was also the worst book in English on the subject, uh, because I was the only person who actually thought of reading a book on the subject, and to this day, I'm not sure whether it has had any readers. But it, it did the trick. I had my little specialty. And it was therefore something of a shock when in January 2011, the very beginning of the Egyptian Revolution, which I was watching primarily on television, I saw in, uh, it was actually my, sort of my favorite moment in the uprising, a journalist from uh, Gazira was interviewing a demonstrator in Tahrir Square. And he put a microphone in this man's uh, face and says, you know, what, what is your demand? And I knew what the answer would be. I want bread, I want freedom, I want uh, a job, or I want, you know, Hosni Bar to get out. But that's not what he said. His demand was a little bit more complicated. He said, our fundamental problem in Egypt is an over-concentration of authority in the hands of the executive. What we need is a truly independent judiciary and a parliament that can exercise true accountability over the executive branch. That's what he said, and that was a fundamental demand in his mind of the Egyptian revolution. And I remember watching <coughs> this and saying, this is not your normal revolution. This is revenge of the nerds. Okay. And the, um, that the specificity of that demand was actually, it wasn't widespread, you couldn't fit it on a poster, but I think what it caught was an awful lot of the spirit that was motivating an awful lot of the, of, of, in a sense, a sudden politicization. It wasn't all that sudden, but the gradual politicization of, of Egyptians that had taken place in the years prior to the revolution, which was so, being so dramatically expressed in the uprising of January, February 2011. And what it was based on was, above all, an incredible faith in politics and the belief that Egypt was beset with all kinds of problems. There were economic problems, there were um, uh, social problems, there were problems, uh, 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 ecological problems, cultural problems, and so forth and so on. But fundamentally, what underlay all of Egypt's problems was the fact that authority in Egypt lay in a few hands, and they were, in a sense, unaccountable. That, that authority in any kind of Egyptian institution, whether it was a political, whether it was a company, whether it was somebody who's gotten hauled into a police station, whatever, authority was, uh, was essentially exercised by people in an unaccountable fashion who did it for their own interest. And that if you could somehow get the political system right, if you could do this primarily through a constitutional process, the, the key, the, 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 the foundation to moving the society forward in all different kinds of realms could be met. This was, in a sense, a very odd attitude on the part of Egyptians, right? Because if there's any population that would have learned very quickly what constitutions cannot do for you in this realm, it would be residents of the Arab world who've experimented with constitutional texts since the 19th century and never been able to find one or find a process that really led for accountable government in any, in any meaningful kind of way. 
But rather than decide this, fund, this process or this, this enterprise is fundamentally flawed, what an awful lot of these uprisings were about, at least when you got into the legal and the political and the constitutional realm, was getting the Constitution right. Um, and um, in a sense, the ground was a little bit promising, it looked like in 2011, especially in a place like Egypt, and I would say in a couple other countries where there were uprisings as well as Tunisia. I'll say a couple words about Tunisia, uh, but I'll focus most of my remarks on, on Egypt. And that was because these were essentially uh, societies where the state, the basic institutions of state, remained intact throughout the uh, uprising. And so it was a matter, it was not a matter of kind of rebuilding from uh, scratch. You didn't have the kind of uh, collapse of the state that you saw in Libya or, 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 or Yemen or so on. You didn't see the massive kind of bloodletting, sectarian warfare that you saw in Syria and Iraq and so on. You saw societies which basically functioned as they did, and you saw states or societies that had basically strong political institutions, and the question was how to reconfigure them in a way uh, that would make them serve the interests of the entire society. Um, and there was tremendous international consensus about how to do this in this kind of situation, right? about constitution writing. Um, th that is to say, in, in over the last uh, generation or so, um, there is a sort of international best practice on how to write a democratic constitution. And essentially, the argument goes something like this. If you want to write a democratic constitution, that means you do it in a democratic manner. And that means the constitution writing has to be done, in a sense, in a, in a prolonged public participatory process, and one which is based primarily on consensus. A constitution, writing a constitution is a time when the fundamental rules of politics are being determined, and it is therefore a time when everybody gets a seat at the table, where, as I say, discussion is public, um, and, and, and so every voice is heard, um, and, and uh, I'm not going to say that every single political actor gets a veto, but you have special decision rules in making constitutions that ensure that it represents not just an ephemeral, ephemeral majority, 50% plus one, or not just a, a product of a narrow technical elite, <coughs> a sort of narrow drafting committee, but something that really expresses broad consensus within the society. Um, so the question that I want to talk about today is, did they do that in Egypt? Or let me put it this way a, a little bit more differently. Can the Arab world, led by these more promising cases, show that constitutions can move from the realm of, of effect to that of cause? That is to say, constitutions existed in the past, but they tended to be produced by existing regimes and, did, and, and essentially were very carefully tailored in order to meet the, 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 the needs of those, uh, of those existing regimes. If you, if, you, if you look at how they were drafted, if you look at the content of those documents, if you look at the political circumstances under which they operated, they were basically, you, if you read an Arab constitution from the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, these were documents that really, as I said, were designed to, more, to, to reflect and to codify the, the will of existing regimes rather than to really constitute the political system. So could, in, in this new post-2011 environment, in which apparently the political rules were for the uh, first time in a long time really up for grabs, was it possible to write constitutions that would not simply reflect existing distribution of power, but would somehow render political authority accountable in the future? And I want to give a clear and unambiguous answer to that question. My answer is, no, but yes, but no, but maybe, but maybe not, okay? So let me first start with the no, focusing on Egypt. Um, uh, so it, it will have a sad beginning and a little bit of a sad end, but a little bit of happiness in the middle. The Egyptian process, I think, right now has left a sour taste in many people's mouths. And the reason, the fundamental reason, I think, was that the process was badly designed from the beginning. Remember what I said about international best practice. I mean, constitutions have to be protracted. The Egyptian process was rushed. That it has to be um, uh, um, um, public. The Egyptian process actually met that. It was, it was, it was, it was. But the, a lot of the key drafting uh, oh, it was 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 done in fairly public view. Um, but it was not done in any kind of consensual process. My own conviction is that it was, this was not necessarily due to any one particular actor hijacking the process, as it's, uh, the word is sometimes used in Egypt, but from a very badly designed process from the beginning. 
And it was badly designed in two ways. Number one, at the very beginning, you had the military overseeing the process. Instead of any kind of consensual process from the beginning, the military basically said, don't worry, we know what we're doing. Uh, we'll run the tr this transition process according to our own rules. And the second was that in order to design the permanent constitution writing process, the military charged a very small committee that basically worked it private for about two weeks to come up with a set of constitutional amendments, which turned out later not to be constitutional amendments, but to be parts of a, of a new interim constitution, which governed the transition process and governed the constitution writing process. And those were ones that as they worked out, um, were majoritarian. If there was any political actor that could capture, I, mean, I won't go through all the details of the process, but if there was any political actor that could capture 50% plus one of the parliament, um, they could basically drive the entire process. That was not put there by design. It was put there, I think, in a fit of absent-mindedness, but it, what it effectively did was after you had parliamentary elections, which you had a large Islamist majority, um, it essentially made this an Islamist-driven process. Um, and the, the <coughs> prospect of consensus um, um, uh, began to recede, and as it receded, different actors, I mean, I think had a structural, almost built-in incentive to almost aggravate this, this, this tendency. Those people who felt like they were being shut out had an option of either kind of going along and trying to get, a, get, get to have some influence over the clauses or trying to disrupt the entire process. And the incentive was, was, was uh, tilted more towards the other side. The Brotherhood, which was essentially the dominant actor in this process, was basically, it had some interest in bringing other, other for political forces along. It concluded fairly early on that that wasn't going to happen or that it wasn't going to make wasn't willing to make the kinds of concessions that would be necessary for that to happen, and so they basically rushed ahead with the process. And I won't go through all the details, but essentially what you had was a constitution, the final draft of which was quite literally written in a process that may have been designed by a student who is rushing on an end of semester paper. That is to say, they did it in an all night session um, where they went through it clause by clause by clause, and if anybody raised an objection, wait, do we really want to do this? The answer was very quickly came from the podium, do you want to keep us here all night? Um, and, um, and so, it, 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 I, I think they finally finished about 5 a.m. or so, that was, a, that, that, that was the process. So it was, it was an outcome that, um, I think rather than reflecting a consensus within the society, is seen regardless of the content of the document, regardless of the content of the document, was seen as one that was dictated by specific political interests and designed to serve those interests. Um, and, and, and in a sense, a lot of the argument about that document was not about its content. There was, there was some, and there's some legitimate uh, criticisms to be made of it, but it was far more on the, on the process by which it was driven. So that's, that's my no answer. I, I promised you a yes. Well, for a yes, let me uh, turn to Tunisia. I will go, to, go through Tunisia very quickly because, number one, I don't know that much about it. Um, and number two, I guess we'll hear more about it, Tunisia and Anakta, at least uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in, in the next panel. I don't know if you're going to cover the constitutional process. But the, the Tunisian process was almost the exact opposite of what the Egyptian was, at least on paper. And I visited Tunisia only a couple times, but I was struck once in the summer of 2011 when I was there, when I would ask Tunisians, why are you doing it this way? You know, uh, why are you designing the process in this way and not that way? Why did you make this decision, not that decision? The answers that I kept on getting back from people were essentially, this is what we did in the late 1950s, when there was a constituent assembly immediately after independence that wrote a constitution. And oddly enough, the, that was a process that was dominated by a party that called itself the Constitution Party. But what Tunisians concluded in 2011 and 2012, and I guess into 2013, is that the problem was that they had let that party essentially dominate the process and tailor the document according to its own interests and the interests of its leader, Habib Bourguiba. So if you could go back to independence, take out that political party, and do the same process over again, you would do it right. Um, and that was what the Tunisians were trying to do. And as opposed to the election results in, in Egypt, uh, the election results for the Constituent Assembly in Tunisia were one uh, which resulted in a majority for no particular political orientation, a plurality for the Islamists, and it was therefore very clear from the beginning that if they wanted to move the <laughs> process forward, they had to build bridges across, across ideological divides. Um, 
And they also decided very early on this, that this constituent assembly was, in a sense, a sovereign body. That is to say, rules made in the interim constitution could not govern what the constituent assembly was, was, was going to do. And, and that gave it an awful lot more freedom, a freedom that it lacked in Egypt, um, and I think that resulted in some of the uh, 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 real institutional problems in the constituent assembly as it operated, because it was constantly uh, uh, afraid that it was that the, it, the one in Egypt was constantly afraid that it was going to dissolve, be dissolved. It, it, there was a six-month time limit, and if it, and it literally was supposed to be dissolved immediately on that six months expiration. The Tunisian Constituent Assembly basically was given a time limit in the in the in the interim constitution from the beginning. They said we're not bound by that. I mean that was an interim constitution. We're elected, so though those kinds of of restrictions cannot cannot govern us. Okay. So that, the Tunisian process is still not completed. They're nearing completion right now, and that, but that would seem to indicate that if you do, the, if you design your, pro, your, your process right from the beginning, you'll do, you'll do it much better. Okay, I also promised you a no. There's, I don't know Tunisian, uh, uh, Tunisia very well, but when I do go there, what I am struck by is the way in which the kinds of diseases that have afflicted the Egyptian political system increasingly over the last couple of years are beginning to show some real signs in Tunisia as well. That is extreme polarization and a growing inability to sort of reach and build coalitions across political divides, a growing, um, um, in a sense, entrenchment in, in, in different camps. And while it is a, the constitutional process is one that is moving forward in Tunisia, what I wonder about in Tunisia is whether they really will succeed Succeed in designing a political process in or the constitutional process, which will allow these various orientations in, Egypt, in Tunisian society to solve and resolve their dis, their differences and to make decisions through a regular political process. I don't know whether that is going to happen or not, um, but but there are. I, I remember being in, in Tunisia last summer and actually giving a talk about contrasting the Egyptian and the Tunisian constitutional experience with the basic bottom line being about how well the Tunisians had designed their process and making Tunisians in the audience extremely angry. They said, no, you don't quite understand. We're just as badly screwed up as the Egyptians on all this. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're giving our process too much credit. And there was, a, a, I think, a growing sense in Tunisia um, that getting the process right doesn't necessarily result in a better, a better product. Um, OK, I promised you. Uh, uh, there's my no, my yes, my no. Now let me give you my maybe. There's a couple interesting things about the Egyptian constitutional process that do give me a little bit more kind of cause for hope. One is, there's, a, 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 the, there's two parts to this maybe. The first part is that the fundamental uh, division in Egyptian political life, there are all kinds of divisions, but a fundamental one is between Islamists and non-Islamists. I mean, each of these camps is itself badly divided. The interesting thing is that Islam was not necessarily the central polarizing element in this constitutional process. And I would say the same was interest, an interesting thing happened in Tunisia as well. When they sit down to argue in Egypt, as they say, what the real bitterness was about the process in Egypt. The religious provisions in the Egyptian constitution have, did cause some debate, and the runs that the, the, the constitutional provisions that resulted have caused some concern, some deep concern among non-Islamists uh, non in the country. But what I think we saw was that it is possible um, to craft constitutional language that can satisfy both Islamists and non-Islamists, at least in theory. The Tunisians seem to have done that. One of the main reasons that you can do that is because of the possibilities of the political process. Right? Islamists, especially of, uh, um, of the Brotherhood variety, or not, it would be the counterpart, it's not a Brotherhood movement, but it looks like one, um, in, in, in Tunisia, realize that any kind of democratic political process is one in which they're likely to do very well. And so, in a sense, they scaled down an awful lot of their uh, Islamic ambitions. There's no need to write in the constitutional text because you can do it through the regular legislative process. And this was explicit thinking in, 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 in Egypt, where the focus was much more on just getting the constitution done rather than what it said. And that, and that made it possible sometimes to craft language. The religious provisions in the Egyptian constitution that do exist are the product of bargaining in which the Brotherhood's main objective was just to get some text down on paper, regardless of what it said. And it was other political actors that really had the substantive demands which the Brotherhood had, uh, uh, had, to, had to meet. 
So in a sense, there's one, there's one way in which a fundamental deep divide can be resolved through constitutional negotiations. There's another maybe as well. And remember I said constitutions being a, a, effect rather than, or a, a cause rather than effect. There are ways in which the Egyptian constitution has already begun to operate in ways that surprise the people who wrote it. This was a brotherhood-driven process, and they've already discovered that, that some of the Egypt, Egyptian constitution's provisions are ones that have operated in ways that make life, political life difficult for them, and they have to learn, learn to live with the results. And this happened, has happened, I won't go into details, but in two areas, one having to do with the prior review of, by the constitutional court of the constitutionality of electoral laws, and the Brotherhood wrote this in, um, and has quickly found out that, it, that the electoral laws it writes keeps on getting bounced back by the constitutional court. So they're having trouble getting a law through that court. A second having to do with, 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 with El Azhar. And here is something that is um, actually, to me, um, uh, surprising. I'm going to put my claim here in very, very bold terms. But if by theocracy what we mean is a political system in which those people with religious knowledge or authority have political authority as well, what the Egyptian, the Egyptian constitution actually has an element that you could consider leaning in a theocratic direction because it gives El Azhar, the, uh, it, it is mandatory to consult El Azhar, the chief seat of Islamic learning in the country, or the, the, uh, the um, uh, body of senior scholars within El Azhar has to be consulted in matters related to the Islamic Sharia. Okay, so that, that provision is in there. It wasn't driven by the Brotherhood, interestingly, but it's, but, but it, but it's in there. And when the Brotherhood sees this, um, it was saying that was something we could live with. As it has resulted, however, what it essentially means, is, and it's already, result, it, it, it's already resulted in El Azhar speaking up on a law which forced the Brotherhood-dominated upper house of parliament um, to revise legislation. And so you have this, this um, um, uh, bizarre situation in which the Brotherhood is actually saying, look, the people's representatives have to decide this. And it's El Azhar, the chief seat of Islamic learning, and says, well, of course, the people's representatives have to decide this. But there is a right way to do things. And if you want to know what the right way is, you have to ask us. Um, so, so, so it's the brotherhood that is the source that, that is arguing for, 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 in a sense, popular sovereignty. And El Azhar that is arguing for a form that of, essentially, religious guidance over the political process. Um, so those are the sorts of ways in which constitution is becoming a, 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 um, um, a cause rather than effect. Finally, let me conclude, um, and don't worry, I will conclude, um, um, uh, with, the, uh, with the maybe not part. Uh, there, I, uh, there are some, some uh, worrying signs here that, again, have nothing to do with the Islamic provisions. In Egypt, in, in, in a sense, those two things that I just talked about, the ways in which the Islamic uh, uh, elements didn't become the center point of controversy, um, and the way in which the Constitution is operating in an unexpected fashion, um, those, if you, if you combine them differently, mean that essentially what the Brotherhood is doing is finding a Constitution that is not operating exactly as it would want. And here is what worries me. It's not Article 2, which is a famous one that uh, Ron made reference to. It's uh, not Article 219, which uh, maybe, Clark, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll talk about. The article that worries me most in the Egyptian Constitution is an article that attracted virtually no attention when it was written. It is Article 150. And it gives the president the authority to call for a referendum in any question he likes. And the results of that referendum are binding on all state institutions. In other words, what it does is give the, is, as I read it, give the president the authority to appeal directly over the head of all institutions in the country and to require all those institutions, including presumably the constitutional court, to do whatever it says. So it gives the president basically an end run around the entire constitution. That is something that he did not have, the president did not have, even under the 1971 constitution. It's exactly the kind of trap door by which Arab constitutions in the pre-2011 era seem to promise democratic procedure, but use sometimes those ex the trappings of democracy, like referendums and elections and so forth, in order simply to enhance the authority of the executive. So what that basically says to President Mohamed Morsi is, if things get really bad, don't worry. You can just call a referendum on whatever you want, and you can go ab ab above the law. That's from the, from, from the, that's the maybe not from the, uh, from the uh, uh, government side. 
And the worrying sign to me for the opposition is the opposition right now in Egypt has coalesced around a campaign that is supposed to culminate at the end of this month um, with large demonstrations, essentially around the, des the demand that, uh, uh, for early presidential elections, something that is clearly has no constitutional basis whatsoever. And what that essentially says is what the opposition, it's, it's driven by sort of a, a campaign um, that was somewhat outside of the leaders of the, of, of the most established opposition groups who've always been sort of weak political actors, but most of those opposition groups have swung behind the campaign. And what that essentially says is that um, this constitution of 2012 may or may not give us tools. But rather than try to make that work or try to see if we can work within the tools of the 2012 Constitution, we're, we are going to go outside the constitutional system, pressure the president essentially for early presidential elections, something that, again, there's, 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 there's zero constitutional basis for. So the Constitution is, is a document that, as it stands right now, doesn't, has a potential, essentially, um, uh, to channel political conflicts, but both sides seem to have reserved the right to go completely outside of the constitutional process. I think we'll probably know over the next few months, in a sense, which direction Egypt will go in. Will the 2012 Constitution be accepted as inevitable by all political actors and become, in essence, something that gradually insinuates in Egyptian political life, or will we see, basically, a return to the constitutional chaos which has governed the Egyptian transition all along? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Brown. Um, our next speaker is uh, Clark Lombardi. Professor uh, Lombardi, um, a professor of law and adjunct professor of international studies at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, he is senior editor of the forthcoming Oxford Encyclopedia of Islam um, and Law and series editor of Oxford University uh, Press's book series, Oxford Islamic Legal Studies. Uh, Professor Lombardi received his JD from Columbia University School of Law uh, and his PhD from Columbia University's Department of Religion with a focus on Islamic studies. He is the author of uh, numerous articles on Islamic law and comparative constitutional law, including the monograph State Law as Islamic Law in Modern Egypt. Uh, and the forthcoming article, Designing Islamic Constitutions, Past Trends, and Options for a Democratic Future, which will appear in the International Journal of Constitutional Law. Aside from his academic work, Dr. Lombardi has worked on numerous legal reform projects in the Muslim world and uh, is a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, Professor Lombardi will uh, uh, talk about who should interpret and implement constitutional provisions referencing Islam? Thank you very much, Professor Shaham, and thank you to the Hebrew University. It's a great honor to be here. I've um, benefited enormously from the scholarship produced at this university, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to share some of my own with you, so thank you. Moving from a micro study of Egypt, I think I'd, I'd like to move to a macro study. Hopefully this will be synergistic with some of the um, comments that um, we heard in the keynote address about the possibility of reconciling democracy and, um, and religious revival, in this case Islamic revival. <clears throat> Even before the Arab Spring, um, the past 40 years witnessed remarkable religious revival around the Islamic world. And this revival profoundly affected constitutions throughout the Islamic world. And most important, it led to the rise of what I call in my forthcoming article, and, and people use different terms for it, but, but I call it Sharia Guarantee Clauses. And a Sharia Guarantee Clause, or an SGC, is a constitutional provision that formally requires all state law to be consistent with the Sharia. And any law that is inconsistent with the Sharia is by implication void. 
Now, recent events in the Arab world have only hastened uh, the spread of these Sharia guarantee clauses, and in some ways it's changed the environment in which they operate. Um, most importantly, it's uh, made clear that these constitutions are going to have to operate in environments that are undergoing democratization. And by that, I don't mean that they'll operate in democracies, but they're certainly going to operate in societies in which there is far more political participation and there is a far more public demand for at least some liberal rights among many members of society. And the question I want to ask is, is it possible to imagine a stable democracy operating under a state that respects and is formally required to respect both Sharia and a constitutional commitment to democratic principles. Now, ultimately, this is going to be an empirical question. We will find out whether this is possible or not because experiments are ongoing all throughout the Muslim world broadly, not just the Arab world. But in the meantime, I'd like to hypothesize, based on past experience of countries, that it is possible but for it to happen, constitutional designers and national leaders will have to pay great attention to constitutional structuring, and they will have to very carefully design the institutions that interpret and apply the Sharia Guarantee Clause. In other words, it's not the presence of a constitutional requirement to respect Sharia that will determine the outcome, but rather the design of the institutions that are going to interpret and apply it that will tell us what's going to happen. Now, in only 20 minutes, I obviously can't say everything I'd like to about this subject, but I would like to give a brief history of Sharia guarantee clauses um, and then turn to the question of who should interpret and apply them. Now, the first thing to remember always about Sharia guarantee clauses is that they evolve from a long pre-constitutional tradition in Islam. Sharia guarantee clauses enshrine into the constitutions of Muslim countries a principle that state law should be consistent with Sharia. And this principle occurred very early in the medieval period of Islamic societies. From roughly the 10th to the 12th century, however, Sunni Muslims agreed in a way that they do not agree today, but they agreed in the past that the interpretation of the Sharia was the exclusive preserve of professional scholar jurists, the fuqaha who were trained and licensed in a guild-like system. And although this began initially in the Sunni world, Shiites too eventually came to accept this principle. Now the pre-modern scholar jurists in both Sunni and Shiite Islam often disagreed about questions, substantive questions of, about what God had commanded. And sometimes these disagreements were quite significant. But it was accepted that when two scholars disagreed, it was impossible to say with any certainty which of the two scholars was correct a problem that could, in theory, create difficulties both in legal uniformity and political legitimacy. And so the Muslim world developed a political theory, religiously rooted, that, had to, that tried to grapple with this problem. Between the 11th and 14th centuries, a number of important Sunni scholars initially argued that the ruler, the ruler of, Islam, of an Islamic state, should have considerable discretion to impose by statute a uniform body of law for the state, even if that prevented some Muslims from following their own preferred and possibly correct interpretation of Islamic law. And it was understood that the scholar jurists who were best qualified to identify rules that were consistent with the Sharia were going to be the scholar jurists. But their only job was to make sure that the statute produced by the ruler was consistent with certain scriptural principles by the essential scriptural principles of Islam and with the public interest. And they did not have to certify that the ruler's rules were consistent with the law as the scholar jurists themselves would ideally apply it. Only that the, scholars, that the ruler's interpretation was reasonable under traditional interpretations. Over time, many Muslim states began to try and legitimize their rule by accepting this principle, this so-called principle of siyasa sharia. And so we have a number of enormously stable empires, most prominently the Ottoman Empire, working in consultation with the fuqaha to develop laws that may not be consistent with the law that the fuqaha would ideally themselves apply, but was at least consistent with the fundamental principles of that law. And this was a powerful legitimizing force throughout the Muslim world for many, many centuries. <clears throat> 
It should be no surprise then that as constitutions first entered the Muslim world, many rulers who were adopting constitutions were perfectly comfortable with the principle of siyasi sharia, the traditional model of legitimizing their rule in Islamic terms. And so they adopted constitutions that implicitly adopted this principle. The first Ottoman constitution and some other early constitutions such as the Tunisian constitution implicitly adopt the principle of siyasi sharia and say that the law of the state will respect the Sharia as understood by classical scholars. The problem was that even as states were adopting constitutions and pledging their allegiance to the traditional model of siyasi sharia, there was a revolution ongoing in Islamic thought. So through, particularly in the early 20th century, Muslims all over the world began to challenge the traditional principle that classically trained scholar jurists, the fuqaha, had unique authority to interpret God's law. And while some people continued to express fidelity to the idea that they should follow the fuqaha's interpretation of God's law, a whole raft of lay Islamists began to articulate new theories of what Islamic law could be and argue that there were new methods that should be carried out by people with very different non-classical training that would more accurately capture what God wanted. And thus, although the principle of siyasi sharia continued to animate the minds of many Muslims, and many people continued to believe that the law of the state would have to respect Islam, there was a new cacophony, a new disagreement about what in fact Islam required and what it would mean for a state to adopt laws that respected Islamic law. And all over the Muslim world, although groups took slightly different forms. They we, we see contest between groups that are operating in similar modes. Most countries in the world see traditionalist organizations continue to be powerful. These are groups that continue to believe that one should interpret the Sharia in line or one shouldn't interpret the Sharia oneself, but rather one should trust the scholar jurist to do so. One sees the rise of scriptural literalists, people who are now often referred to as Salafis, one might refer to them also as fundamentalists, but they're people who go back to the initial scriptures and try to follow them literally. And then there's a broad and diverse group of modernists, people who favor highly untraditional techniques for interpreting God's law. Some of these techniques lead modernists into conservative directions and some of them in, in, indeed reactionary directions and some into liberal directions. But in any case, you see a true cacophony of disagreement about how to interpret God's law. Something that Professor, um, w that we heard in our, our lunchtime uh, discussion is perhaps a, a, a necessary, if not sufficient, condition for democracy to um, occur. What's most interesting, and Professor Brown has talked about this in some of his work, is that the cacophony the, of disagreement about how to interpret Islam became so significant that many countries around the world despaired. They despaired of legitimizing their rule in Islamic terms at all. They simply believed that we cannot come up with one interpretation of Islamic law. We cannot conform our law and demonstrate its conformity with an interpretation of Islamic law that will satisfy even a critical mass of our people. And so, starting, in the, um, starting early in the 20th century, but picking up speed, one begins to see the elimination of Sharia guarantee clauses in constitutions. While Sharia guarantee clauses had, had appeared in early constitutions when rulers were comfortable that they knew what the Sharia required, once contest appeared and it became impossible to conform one's law with any publicly acceptable interpretation of Islam, Sharia guarantee clauses begin to disappear. And so for much of the 20th century, one sees constitutions that don't make reference to Islamic law and don't pledge that the government will respect Islamic law. But with the failure of alternative ideologies in the late 20th century and the failure of the socialist, Marxist, nationalist, and other legitimizing ideologies that states had substituted for Islam, as those failed, rulers began to go back to the idea that they might have to legitimize their rule in Islamic terms. The problem was they were not sure, and their publics were not sure, exactly what 
form of Islam they should be conforming their laws to. And so this is the paradox that states began to find themselves in in the 1970s. They felt themselves increasingly compelled by public pressure to adopt Sharia guarantee clauses and to promise to respect Islamic law. But for them to actually satisfy the public that they had done so, they were going to have to create some kind of consensus about what Islamic law required. And so this is the paradox that governments have been struggling with for about 40 years. And we have some understanding of what types of institutions are effective at creating public consensus in favor of an interpretation of Islam that the state can respect and what types of institutions um, cannot. Now, there's one thing that we need to bear in mind about the history of Sharia guarantee clauses from 1970 until, say, 2000, which is that most of the governments that applied them, most of the governments that were trying to legitimize themselves were not democratic, and they had no interest in being democratic. They were unapologetically authoritarian. And so when they began to develop interpretation, when they began to adopt Sharia guarantee clauses and create mechanisms to interpret and enforce them, they did not actually feel that they had to satisfy all citizens in their society that their interpretation of Islam was correct. They merely needed to satisfy a critical mass of important Muslims, sometimes an important minority. So in these societies, you often have institutions being set up, sometimes political institutions run by bureaucrats, and sometimes courts that are designed to review state laws and determine whether or not they respect Islam. But they do so in line with a version of Islam that is respected by some minority of Muslims in the society that the government wishes to satisfy. And we see a whole range of institutions created um, to do that. If one looks in Afghanistan, for example, which has had a Sharia guarantee clause since the early 20th century, one sees that uh, political institutions were allowed to judge for themselves. The king was allowed to judge for himself in consultation with advisors whether his law was consistent with the Sharia as the Constitution required. And in so doing, he consistently favored a very traditional Hanafi version of Islamic law that was not, in fact, the predominant version of Islam among his people but was um, the favored version of Islam among very powerful armed conservative elites that had overthrown past kings. In other words, this was the group he wished to satisfy, and this was the group that he consulted with. In other countries, for example, Pakistan, liberal modernists also, who controlled the army, um, developed a group of a, a body of institutions designed to consult with the executive. So they're executive institutions, and they're designed to consult with the executive and with the parliament um, to determine whether or not the law is consistent with Islam. But they're consistently dominated by liberal modernists who espoused a version of Islam that was favored by the bureaucracy and the military. In other countries, for example, Iran, after the revolution, you have the government deciding that it's going to favor a very conservative traditionalist form of Islam, and it creates a court that is to be staffed entirely by traditionally trained conservative jurists. And although it's a judicial institution, it's entirely predictable that it will interpret and apply Islam in a way that is consistent with a traditional conservative interpretation of Islam. In each case, what you have is a, uh, the government creating a mechanism that will interpret and apply a Sharia guarantee clause that in a way that is consistent with the interests or the ideological preferences of a powerful minority. In democracies and in countries that are democratizing, this is really no longer an option. Institutions have a much more difficult task in front of them. What they're going to have to do is engage with a variety of different interpretations of Islam. In fact, they'll have to understand, study, and engage with the full variety of interpretations of Islam that are powerful in that particular country. And they will have to try and come up with an interpretation of Islam that is deemed at least reasonable by a critical mass of these contesting groups. And this is a much harder task. We don't actually have an example of an institution to date, at least in, in my studies, 
that has been interpreting Islam in a fully democratic society. So it's a little bit hard to say with any certainty whether or not this is possible. But what we do have are several examples of countries in which authoritarian or deeply imperfect democratic regimes have come under sufficient political pressure that they have felt compelled to try and build up their legitimacy genuinely among a broad cross-section of their subjects. And in these countries, you do see the rise of institutions that are engaging in, in, engaging in a process that looks similar to the process that a truly democratic institution would engage in. They are involved essentially in creating discourse with so in creating discourse in society about what Islam might require under certain circumstances. They are coming up with interpretations of Islam that are designed to appeal to a broad cross-section. And when I say appeal, it lead to, to be deemed reasonable by a broad cross-section of Muslims in society. And then they are weighing the response of the public to their interpretations and sometimes modifying it. I have two examples that I want to give you. One is, is a weak example of, of, of a of a potentially successful model. And it's one that many people might be surprised that I'll give. Um, that's the example of Pakistan. Uh, many people understand the history of Pakistan in 1977, when General Zaya took over an Islamized society, uh, as an example of an, author of an authoritarian imposing um, by force his own deeply felt interpretation of Islam and his deeply conservative interpretation. But if one looks at the history of Pakistan, um, a, slightly different, a slightly different picture begins to appear. General Zaya, when he took power, was actually quite weak. Um, and he had overthrown a quite popular and popularly elected, arguably demagogic political leader. And he interpreted a society in which not only had he disaffected leftist organizations, but he had inherited a society in which a very, very powerful group, arguably a majority of Pakistanis who favor a conservative interpretation of Islam, had been alienated by the dominance of liberal modernists in Pakistan. And his response was to try and create um, both to apply statutes that would move part way towards Islamizing Pakistani society and also to amend the constitution to require that all law respect Sharia. In other words, the Pakistani constitution for the first time formally adopted a judicially enforceable clause requiring state law to respect Sharia. And to interpret and enforce this new provision, he did something rather interesting. He created a new court that was staffed both by members of the traditional judiciary who were heavily wedded to liberal modernist interpretations of Islam, but also delegated seats on it to what he called the ulama, who would be people with classical, who, who would be people with classical training, who would represent more conservative and or conservative modern, so traditionalist or conservative modernist interpretations. And the federal Sharia court and the Sharia appellate bench, which are the two courts that he created, um, have developed a body of jurisprudence that is remarkable for its timidity in imposing a conservative interpretation of Islam and remarkable also for their attempts to write enormously long opinions justifying their opinions and trying to demonstrate their reasonability to a broad cross-section of Muslims. Um, the court allows for dissents so that everyone gets a chance to express their opinion or disagreement, their agreement or disagreement with the opinion, itself creating more discourse um, and in that also lends to a certain moderation on the part of the court. Now, the court has a whole number of problems with it, including a lack of judicial independence um, and fairly weak powers and also fairly limited jurisdiction. And one can't say that it's been a roaring success at developing an interpretation of Islam that Pakistanis are generally comfortable with or at legitimizing the Pakistani state in the eyes of all Pakistanis. If it had done so, we wouldn't see the religious violence that we do to this day in Pakistan. But one thing that's extremely interesting to me is that when Pakistan returned to democratic rule um, a few years ago, one of the first things that it did was engage in a, body of, in, in a series of judicial reforms that gave uh, new powers and new independence to the Supreme Court, but also 
gave new powers and independence and new jurisdiction to the federal Sharia court. In other words, deciding that it wanted this court, the new, the, the new populace really at this point speaking democratically decided that they wanted to see the court play a role. That pattern is even more evident in Egypt, which is a more successful um, case of largely the same story. In the 1970s, starting in 1971 with the 71 Constitution and then through a series of amendments, uh, the government of Anwar Sadat, which was remarkably weak at that period, um, after both the failures of the NASA regime and a series of struggles by Sadat to establish himself within the Arab Socialist Union, um, amended the Constitution in a number of ways. It guaranteed fidelity to uh, Islam, so it adopted a Sharia Guarantee Clause, and it also um, adopted a series of clauses respe respecting uh, democratic principles. And, in all, and finally, created a new institution, the Supreme Constitutional Court, that was allowed to uh, perform judicial review to interpret um, and apply the Constitution and to enforce constitutional guarantees both in the area of Islamic law and in the area of democratic rights. And one of the great um, remarkable stories of, of the 1980s and 90s in Egypt was the rising power of the Constitutional Court in Egypt to develop its own power and to establish itself as a voice both for the interpretation of what it would mean for, Islam, uh, for Egypt to be an Islamic state and for Egypt to be a democratic state. Now, it grew so powerful that in the, um, that in the 2000s, uh, Hosni Mubarak actually um, decided to defang the court. He stacked the court, he cut its powers, and effectively neutralized it as a major force in Egyptian politics. But we should understand that he did so precisely because it had been so effective at beginning to establish a compelling vision of what a democratic and Islamic Egypt would be, that he was begin that the court was beginning to articulate a vision that could unite Islamists and liberals in Egypt. And it's a sign of its success that it had to be cut down. And another interesting thing is that in the aftermath of the Arab Spring, a Pew poll, which looked at the priorities of Egyptians for the coming decades asked what are the most important things that you hope for the new constitutional regime and the new government of Egypt. And the two most important things in it were respect for the Sharia and a powerful judiciary. This is more important than elections. And this again bespeaks, I think, a remarkable amount of confidence in a society that is skeptical, though maybe growing more confident about politics, is nonetheless skeptical about the way politics operates, that the judiciary, judges like the judges on the Supreme Constitutional Court can ideally, or Egyptians can imagine that such judges could play a role in mediating the complex uh, challenge of creating a state that is both democratic and liberal. With that in mind, I think we should say that we do see examples of courts that seem to be engaging in the sort of discursive and mediating function that they would need to if we're going to see a democratic and liberal group of society and Islamic group of societies appear in the Arab world and outside it. Um, and we see that Muslims themselves in many of these countries believe that courts can play this sort of role, and I'm not sure we should bet against them. But we should ask then, what would we need to do for courts to play this sort of role? Uh, one thing they'll clearly need to do is to be staffed by people who are considered um, sufficiently expert in Islamic law by the citizens of that country that they will um, be able to play a mediating function. Quite simply, they need to know enough about Islam and be trusted enough by the people in that country that they will be permitted to engage in discourse and propose um, an answer. Another thing that will have to be done is that there will need to be democratic protections uh, uh, for, there will need to be protection of judicial independence for the courts that engage in that function. And there will need to be robust guarantees of free speech and criticism of court decisions and ideally promotion of criticism of court decisions so that they can properly, uh, they can properly engage in their function. Um, with that in mind, since I've already overstayed my welcome at this podium, I'll, um, I, I'll leave you all. But I, would, but I would only say this. I do believe deep that, we, that Sharia guarantee clauses are not going anywhere. And on this, I have empirical evidence on my side. They are spreading.
throughout the world, and they are probably going to continue to spread to countries where they currently do not exist. And if that is true, we all have a stake in ensuring that these clauses are interpreted in a way that is as democratic as possible. I have great hope that one can come up with a compromise that will be acceptable to, um, to most of the people within countries and hopefully to the international community as well. But even if that's not true, we owe it to the citizens of all these countries and to ourselves to make sure that the process of synchronization goes as far as it possibly can. And we do have some hints from past experience that will help us understand what that will be. Thank you. I thank both uh, Professor Brown and Professor Lombardi for presenting us with a much more complex picture, not about only the text of constitutions, but about the political processes in which uh, constitutions uh, are created, and especially uh, the importance of, uh, uh, of processes of interpretation of constitutional texts. Um, our last speaker in uh, this panel is uh, Professor Amnon Cohen uh, from the Hebrew University. Professor Cohen uh, is uh, Eliyahu Elat Professor Emeritus of the History of the Muslim People in the Hebrew University's Department of Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies. He was the director of uh, the Harry S. Truman Research Institute for the Advancement of Peace. Uh, over the years, he taught as a visiting professor at a number of universities overseas, including Princeton and the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Cohen was awarded the 2007 Israel Prize for Land of Israel Studies for his monumental research on the Jews of Jerusalem under Ottoman rule based on the archives of the local Sharia court. In recent years, Professor Cohen researches political and social developments in the post-Saddam era in Iraq and the impact uh, of the country's ethnic and the communal fault lines. And he will uh, talk to us on the Iraqi constitution, theory versus practice. Please, Professor Cohen. Thank you, Ronnie. <clears throat> what I'm, uh, I'll try to do in the time allocated to me, allocated to me is uh, go through the main clauses of the Iraqi constitution that was enacted back in 2005, that is almost uh, nine years ago, and uh, which is referred to as the lasting constitution by Iraqis, that is, there were earlier ones, but this is probably, hopefully, going to be the last one. And then uh, try and um, identify certain fields or certain points where, the, where reality doesn't necessarily follow the text, and when it does, it actually clashes with some of these clauses, and at the end, I'll try and highlight what I think are the major problems that might ensue, that might uh, emerge from this clash uh, between uh, political life and textual constitution. Well, all constitutions are textual, of course. The long preamble of this lasting constitution, uh, starting with the traditional Basmala invocation, is thrown with historical references, some factual, other more legendary in nature, to the many achievements of the Iraqi nation throughout long, its long history, lacking the familiar and traditional adjective or qualifying adjective Arab. Couched in a flowery style, it glosses over historical periods and different components of the Iraqi people, which created allegedly the new Iraq, quote unquote, that of the future made up of predominantly Arabs Kurds and Turkmen. Guided by a plethora of values, it should aim at establishing the Iraqi, an Iraqi voluntary and multifaceted union, republican, federal, democratic, pluralistic, they are all in the text, free of sectarianism and racism, discrimination and exclusion, end of quote. These are lofty ideals, at times contradictory, at times quite vague and visionary, of which the particularly unrealistic one, given the reality of Iraq that we are acquainted with, is that of freedom of sectarianism. 
First and foremost, among the basic principles guiding the Republic of Iraq is Islam, of course, referred to not only as its official religion, but also as a fundamental source of legislation, not the fundamental. By way of adding more weight to this general formulation, specific bridles are put to the future legislation. It shouldn't contradict the established provisions of Islam, but also those of democracy and basic freedoms. To Israeli ears, this is reminiscent of the um, inside uh, tension between democratic and uh, Jewish state. Religious rights and other minority, of other minorities are guaranteed by way of diluting somewhat the Islamic nature of the republic, and a similar compromise is sought on an even more sensitive issue, that of nationality. In a country that is referred to as of many nationalities, the missing qualifier Arab is moderately compensated by a specific reference to the Arab League, of which Iraq is a founding member, hence it will be committed to its covenant. Another aspect of the Kurdish achievements is demonstrated when Arabic and Kurdish are referred to as the two official languages of Islam, of Iraq, sorry. However, by way of balancing off the highlighting of Kurdish cultural and political gains, it is specifically pointed out that no law may be um, enacted that contradicts the constitution, the legal and conceptual supremacy of which will be binding, and I quote, in all parts of Iraq without exception, end of quote. Section, section two of the constitution, focusing on rights and freedoms, is summed up by Professor Brown in one of, uh, not the best book, but another article. Um, rights and, I quote, rights and freedoms provisions have grown very extensive in modern constitutions, but many drafting efforts concentrate, on more, concentrate more on naming freedoms rather than developing firm, firm structural guarantees to protect them. This criticism can certainly be made of the Arab, all Arab constitutions, said Professor Brown, including the current Iraqi draft." End of quote. We shall come back to, the, to discuss the application of this statement to the Iraqi case. In the meantime, one may point out several examples of basic rights from the long list drawn by the Constitution, equality by this Constitution. Equality before the law be without any discrimination, equal opportunities, sanctity of homes, independence of the judiciary, etc., etc. The many constitutional rights enumerated in this section of the Constitution convey an, an impressive picture of progressive rights and freedoms to all. But here again, a balancing act, this time tilted in favor of the Shi leaders, may be noted by Article 41. It replaced an earlier decision of the Iraqi Governing Council from back 2003, where Resolution 137 abolished the existing law of 1959. This basically progressive law brought personal status matters under state control, and though amended several times later, it still granted Iraqi women rights that had been restricted or even totally missing, mostly in rural areas, but also in towns. The Shia clerics objected this approach, Hence, the pressure brought about the, brought about the passing of this earlier resolution of, 100, of 137. True, the new article of the Constitution sounds quite liberal when it states, and I quote, Iraqis are free in their commitment to the in their commitment to their personal status according to their religions, sects, beliefs, or choices, and this shall be regulated by law, unquote. However, the very fact that the existing lenient and conceptually more modern version had been given up and replaced by recourse to religious jurisprudence didn't eliminate the old version as an option, but indicated a possible major regression for women when it turned out, when it turned it from an accepted rule to potential exception. And whoever is interested more in this topic, I refer him to Noga Frati's book on women in Iraq. The third, the third section deals with federal authorities. The legislative one art, art, deals with articles deal with the ordinary activities of the, this important body, which is rightly seen as directly expressing the will of the people, even to the extent of watching carefully and systematically trying to supervise the performance of the executive. Here too, quite a number of general principles are laid. However, the practical application is being deferred until a, rev a relevant law be enacted. The relative importance, referred to as rights and privileges of the Speaker of the House, for example, will be regulated, as suggested by Article 63, in the future, an unlimited interval in, is enabled, that enables the present one, Usama Nujaifi, that's the name of the, the Speaker of the House, 
to present almost eight years after the promulgation of the Constitution a competitive edge to Prime Minister Maliki, much beyond the mere nuisance value. Another element that seems commendable are specific references to the right of Parliament members to direct questions to the Prime Minister or Ministers, who should, once date is set, come before the plenum, discuss the relevant matter, and give an account on the issues within the authority. Monitoring the performance of the executive authority, it was referred to, but distinctly, put as it is, no mechanism is provided to make the, the ministers, as well as the prim, prime minister, abide by this principle. Hence, for example, Maliki, the prime minister, had been invited to discuss several crucial matters with the parliament. A date was set about a month and a half ago, but the distinguished invitees simply didn't show up, and no alternative date had been set for so far. On the positive side of the balance sheet, the articles dealing with the legislature um, may point out, we may point out art, one article 49, which gets a binding requirement for any election law, even future ones, to, and I quote, achieve a percentage of women representation no less than one quarter of the Council of Representative me Members. Arbitrary as it may right, rightly be looked upon, this proved to be an important criterion followed faithfully by all political parties. Coming back to specific which, uh, specifics which, independent of actual drawbacks in the materializing, deserve attention and acclaim, is allowing the parliament a role in senior appointment, though upon an earlier recommendation of the prime minister, for instance, military or diplomatic or even judicial realm, in the judicial realms, where, to quote Brown again, this is mark, a marked departure from the norm in the Arab world, unquote. Turning to the executive, generally speaking, in order to qualify as a president, the candidate should be supported by at least two-thirds of the House, and if his position becomes vacant, it should be filled in by an elected replacement. During the interim, Speaker of the House will replace him until the new one is elected. The extended absence of almost six consecutive months of the present President Talabani from his office due to his failing health and his hospitalization in Germany, prompted in mid-May, that is about a month ago, a, um, an attempt to relieve him of all obligations, but this was turned down as unconstitutional, I quote, by the Parliament Judicial Committee, claiming that the job wasn't empty, since he had a number two who was sitting in and filling in for him, Mr. Khazai. The President of the Republic, though representing symbolically the nation as a whole, meaning the many, that many of his duties are ceremonial, enjoys some practical responsibilities. Among his powers, he is supposed to ratify international treaties, which is normal, and agreements. But he also has to ratify and issue the laws um, enacted by parliament. Although on the face of it, this may be seen as a mere formality, the latter, that is laws ratification, may carry with it a substantial political weight because it turned out, if turned down by him, uh, an act of legislation constitutionally reached may become null and void. Hence, his authority overrules that of legislature and creates an irregular balance of powers in Iraq. As for the cabinet, one of the first duties of the president is to nominate the person representing the large, largest bloc, who in his turn will name the members of the cabinet, like this country. The constitution seems to convey a very optimistic approach, which it limits to a period of few, uh, of few weeks only uh, for that. Reality proved much more difficult when it actually took several months in 2010 to reach a decision to who heads the largest block then for Nur al-Maliki, who was uh, chosen, to set up a coalition and a very large one, about 40 ministries, a uh, large cabinet. That was later cut down to size. The third authority is judiciary, of course. Generally accepted principles are highlighted, first and foremost, the independence of all courts and judges, who will have no authority over them except for the law similar to the procedure mentioned earlier on other authority powers, that perhaps, uh, and perhaps even more so, much is left to, for specific laws to be enacted on a later date. Federalism, a term that was uh, gradually introduced by the Kurds in earlier years into the political life of Iraq, became much more important, almost a cornerstone of the state after the collapse of Saddam Hussein. The federal government, as the custom of the republic, as the custodian, sorry, as the custodian of the Republic and its highest regarded values, will have an exclusive authority in matters of foreign policy, national security, and fiscal policy, three realms. 
the particular conditions of Iraq, the land of the two rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris, um, had uh, brought about adding to this distinguished list also water sources from the outside Iraq as well. Much more problematic is the case of another liquid, oil, or perhaps oil and gas, that will be administered by the, administered by the federal government from all current fields, the term is important, in cooperation with the governments of the producing regions. The revenues are to be distributed fairly, is the term, in a way, and once again I quote, compatible with the demographic distribution of all over the country, unquote. Even with this succinct form formulation, obvious question remarks arise. How about future fields? If current fields are within the, the central government, who will take care of future fields? What is the exact meaning of which regional government? A most important article which needs immediate attention even prior to the by now almost normative sentence to be regulated by a specific law. And then all other matters not excluded as a prerogative of the federal authority will be left to be attended to by the regional and provincial authorities, the administration, and even the particular laws. The fifth section deals with the elaboration of the concept federalism, not in theoretical terms, but with regard to its role in Iraq's actual political life. Instead of suggesting means and ways to tighten the grip of the 80 years old Iraqi state on its entire territory and population, it puts forward this decentralizing mechanism, which may, if actually carried out, bring about a disintegration of the one, in the, of the one entity of the state into several autonomous parts. Taking its cue from the experience of the, Kur of the Kurds, Kurdish three provinces, the Constitution allows, perhaps even encourages, the amalgamation of several provinces, Muhafaza, into larger units referred to as regions, Iqlim. One or more provinces who so wish, wish may submit a request for a referendum to this effect um, in one or two methods, either submitted by a third of the members of the provincial council involved or by one-tenth of the votes, voters therein. The idea is not just a symbolic move, since the desired region will have control over nearly all aspects of life. They will adopt a constitution of their own, will establish particular offices in Iraqi embassies abroad, and so on and so forth. This is an idea that was first raised during the early post-Saddam years in Shi provinces in the south, who felt that they might this way may meaningfully improve their financial lot by enjoying directly a much larger share of the income from oil extracted in and exported from the provinces, e.g. from Basra. Such a request, though on, the face of, though, on the face of it may sound statistically administratively reasonable, may lead to a possible disintegration of Iraq as a nation, if carried to its logical conclusion. Especially if or when the Sunni provinces, who are naturally objective to, it, to this initiative, express a similar desire. I'll come back to it in a second. The concept of creating regions, it claims, out of one or more provinces and elaboration was an elaboration of an article previously formulated um, in the Transitional Administrative Law, TAL, which had been introduced to Iraq in an earlier stage of the American occupation. Unlike most of its other articles, explicitly abolished in the newly adopted constitution, this element was left intact and was even upgraded, as we've just pointed out. By the same token, another problematic matter was left to be dealt with in the future. The, this is the original Article 58, which became in this constitution uh, Clause 140. This one related to the sensitive issue of Kirkuk. Historically speaking, a gradual process of Kurdish population settling in Kirkuk had been halted by Saddam Hussein, who tried to change the tide of, event, tide of events by moving large numbers of Arabs into Kirkuk, offering many incentives to them. This article established certain mechanism, mechanisms aimed at turning back this wheel of history with the intention of, resolving, of revo resolving the demographic issue as well as that of the boundaries of the province. While the Kurdish leadership insisted on their claim that this town and province had always been Kurdish, hence it should be included in Kurdistan, they agreed to wait until its old residents, mostly Kurds as they claim, be restored in their homes and properties. The permanent demographic and administrative nature should therefore be deferred according to this protracted process of normalization, 
a census would be, should be carried out and then a referendum be conducted, and only then, allegedly, justice will prevail. Today, almost 10 years later, things have not meaningfully changed. Though the promised law of, uh, the promised law of regions was passed in October 2006, uh, the Constitutional Review Committee that was promised in order to placate the Sunni's fears and objections couldn't attain its main goals. As admitted by the chairman of this uh, committee, um, after one more, about a year of deliberations, it couldn't disentangle the Kirkuk complex issue, nor could it agree on the major questions like Arab nature of Iraq and similar questions. As long as these problematic issues remain unattended to, future that deterioration of the situation may occur. The question, which I leave to the last part of my presentation, is what has happened ever since on these last two issues, that is federalism and oil. Federalism first. The, the idea of a single Shia region in the south, made of several Muhafazas provinces, is mainly propagated by the Hakim family from 2005 onwards, a Shi, most distinguished family. While most of the Shi'is are openly against it for obvious reasons, they actually control Iraq. Requests for federalism, ref federalism referendums raised in several governments later on since 2010, that is over the last two years or three years, were neither addressed nor acted upon by the Mal Maliki government, and there's a whole list of them. This was a clear infraction of the Constitution, which charges the cabinet with putting the referendum in motion as soon as the requests are received. Most recently, and this is more important even, or more interesting, similar noises are voiced and voices are heard from the Sunni provinces as well. That is from Anbar and, and Mosul demonstrations. Uh, there are demonstra the uh, demonstrations we have been taking place in these provinces for the last three or four months, and among the slogans that are being raised there is down with the constitution, which is, uh, and, and uh, hoping that a region of the um, Sunnis will be uh, established. In other words, the present text of the Constitution enables initiatives by different politicians who may thus use the term federalism or the concept or the articles of federalism as an actual example uh, of Kurdistan show, as a tool towards political agendas and tendencies for greater sectarianism, which may endanger the unity of Iraq with little reference to what the people actually want or with the, uh, little reference to the opposition of the present prime minister of the, of the country. Last point, oil and gas. The centrality of oil for Iraq is quite obvious. Hence, the jurisdiction of its existing fields was given exclusively to the central government. However, the efforts exerted by the Kurdistan regional government in order to explore and extract oil from the future fields not the current ones which are left to the central government, as well as the division of revenues accruing from the sec this sector became an insurmountable political bone of contention. How should the re residual rights of Kurdish oil coincide with those of the federal authorities were questions to be dealt with in, in a law to be drafted by the cabinet. Indeed, 2007 witnessed a draft prepared and leaked out even, but never presented to the parliament thus remaining one of the several versions that are still ink on paper, as they say in Arabic, that is uh, theoretically only, or binding only. The 50 or so contracts signed by the Kurdistan regional government with international companies um, uh, are not recognized for oil drilling and oil uh, um, uh, extraction, uh, are not recognized, are not recognized by the central government Hence, although in practical terms the Kurds are free to export their oil and gas, the, inco the income therefrom is supposed to go into a special account run by the federal government, where from the 17% allocated by the budget to the Kurdish provinces are defrayed. About two years ago, the parliament, Parliament's Oil and Gas Committee came out again with another version of the proposed law, but the extra weight it suggested to the, for the cabinet meant that the Kurds were, came out against it and nothing came out of it. So far, Iraq stays without hydrocarbons law whatsoever. To sum up, shifting political alliances have enabled the system to function. In spite of an organized absence from the, the parliament duties of whole blocks of politicians who are supposed to be part of the present Maliki ruling coalition, 
Some crucially important laws, like for instance the budget, the annual budget, are passed and then acted upon. Unsatisfactory though, but a very practically interim arrangement or solution. As long as these are results of backroom deals on the actual application of the Constitution, they reflect agreements between major sectoral blocs and, very faulty process, and a very faulty process of government. Adel Abdel Mahdi, the resigning vice president, referred to it as follows, and I quote from him, we need a parliamentary system, but at the moment we have no particular system at all. Institutions don't function and the constitution is not really applied, unquote. Even though this may be putting too strong a stress on, on the legislative drawbacks, he rightly puts his finger on a sore point. The overwhelming presence of ethnic sectoral considerations seem to be deflecting the underlying logic of the Constitution, and much attention should be paid in the future to prevent fed the federal idea from turning into a co-federal reality, or perhaps even worse. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Cohen. Uh, I think uh, we have a few minutes for uh, some questions. Maybe we'll steal a few minutes from the uh, coffee break. Okay, uh, Sasha. Maybe we'll collect a few questions. I Thank you. 
Okay, so I think um, we start with the meeting. The comparative question about Israel is a great one. Uh, it's not one that I can shed particularly particular light on. Let me simply point out one uh, one thing. That's, um, the, the cases that I am f most familiar with um, are obviously in the Arab world, and it strikes me that you can come up with all kinds of structural similarities, but there's one big social difference, and that is to say that the secular, the non-religious option is a viable public argument in Israel that does not exist in most Arab states, with the possible exception of Tunisia. You, it, you, the, there is no argument that I know of in any Arab state against establishing Islam as the official religion. And once you put a Sharia clause in the Constitution, it becomes almost impossible to dislodge because then you're arguing against, against Sharia. So you've got a fundamentally different di political dynamic here when you're dealing with those questions. Um, with regard to personal status, um, it's a great question, and I, I don't have the text in front of me, so, I, so, I, so I, I, I can't quote it to you. Essentially, there is an existing way of dealing with this question, which is enshrined in the Constitution, and that is to say that personal matters of personal status are determined by your religious community. Um, in Egypt, Islam is the default option, but recognized other religions um, um, uh, personal status is 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 governed by them, and but the Islam the, the Islamic version is codified. That is to say, it is written by a parliament based on um, their interpretations of uh, or, or what, what 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 they choose to codify out of the Islamic legal tradition. The 2012 Constitution essentially enshrines that compromise. The verbal formulas in the 2012 Constitution differ in some ways from those previous ones, but not in ways that actually change the way that these, these, these uh, matters are dealt with. One interesting effect, what they did in the 2012 Constitution, um, was for the first time give explicit constitutional recognition to Judaism as a religion. It came about half a century too late for any Egyptian Jews, but, but they finally got their, their, their um, in a, a full constitutional recognition. An interesting effect of this is, I mean, there's all, there are different religious freedom provisions in the Egyptian constitution. There's a, you know, a, 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 but, but what this means often in operational terms, I would I'd like to summarize the following way, and I'm summarizing constitutional text, not quoting its language. Believe whatever you want. When it comes to practicing religion, pick one of the following approved religions. Okay. And if you pick Islam, please don't change your mind. That's not actually in any, in, in, in any text, but it becomes, it, 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 it's not juridically barred, but it becomes very, very difficult um, uh, in, a, in a sense politically to do it. So that's effectively um, uh, the, the system for uh, 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 personal status in, in Egypt. The Tunisian text is just being finalized, and I don't know what the final text is. You've got a personal status law in Tunisia that um, essentially has been taken, uh, uh, we, 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 it has been taken off the table in the constitutional negotiation, so far as I know. I mean, we may hear more later, but, but essentially, Anahda an, an has decided to um, resign itself, I think, to a law that um, Islamic personal status law is not my strong suit, but that perhaps pushes um, the provisions of Islamic personal status law um, a little bit to the limits. Um, whether or not it's consistent with it or not, I'm not prepared uh, uh, to say, but it's going farther than almost any other uh, uh, country would while still claiming to be operating within the Islamic tradition. Okay, well, thank you for these um, excellent questions. I, I, on the question of Israel, I, I just don't think I know enough about Israeli, um, the, the Israeli situation to, to speak on it. I would say that Indonesia is a country in which you've had active pushback against um, in, incorporation, as we, and, and that Indonesia may be a very interesting example of, of a country to, that's managed its religious identity in a, in a pluralistic setting, so that's the only but for that, you have another expert who you've heard from already, so, so I then defer again. Um, as to the two questions um, that I got, specifically about Pakistan, um, 
I think we, we could talk a little bit about the, the full nature of, of the debates. The, the most famous argument against creating a judicial enforcement of a Sharia guarantee in the Pakistani constitution was the one you leveled. But there was an enormous discussion with the ulema. Um, the initial proposal was that the ulema would serve on a court, a special ulema court, and the parliament would get an override, something that would look something like what Stephen Gardbaum has called the new Commonwealth Constitutions. That proved unacceptable to both sides for different reasons, and so they moved to, political, to a political um, review of legislation, which was then justified in the way you said. I think this shows the complexity of the problem facing countries that want to incorporate Islam when there is so much disagreement, and Pakistan is a great example of that. The question you ask, well, how do you do it? Well, I, I think there are a couple of, a couple of ways, and, and I've, I ex expand on them at, at some more length in, in, uh, in an article. The first is to take a minimalist definition of what, what principles the law has to comply with. And Pakistan did that. So as you say, they didn't use the term Sharia because the term Sharia was associated with fiqh. And that what they did not want to do is say that the law had to be consistent with traditional interpretations of the Quran and Sunnah and, uh, and Islamic law. What they did instead is it has to be consistent with Islamic principles broadly construed and then left it to the political process to determine whether or not that was satisfied. That strikes me as a minimalist definition of what, what the state has to, what, what principles the state has to um, respect. And that's an important first step. The other one is to ensure that the political process, either through political process or in the context of litigation, promotes active discourse among all of these communities. All communities have to feel represented either in the political process or feel represented on the court and through the process of litigation. And that is where Pakistan singularly failed during this period of political review of legislation because conservatives, both the Jama'ati Islami and the ulama traditions, felt that they were not represented in the, in the oligarchical government, military or um, industrial in Pakistan at the time. And that's why a new court had to be created that tried to bring in more voices. So it strikes me that that's the appropriate step to go forward, which is to say you create a minimalist definition and then you create an environment. It may be a judicial environment, it may be a political environment in which you identify the voices that need to be heard and you encourage them to take part in it. And it strikes me that Pakistan took a imperfect step in that direction in the Zaya years and continuing to today, but that Egypt, under Sadat and Mubarak, took a much more productive step in creating that type of discourse. I hope that answers the question. Now, with the second question with regard to Iraq, I, I think you're actually referring to a, a paper, since I didn't mention Iraq in my talk, but I did distribute to some, um, to, to some students a, a paper, that, the paper that I, that I just referred to you to, and it does mention Iraq. And it, just so everyone knows what this question refers to, Iraq is extremely interesting on this particular question because the, as, as we've heard, the Iraqi constitution explicitly creates a, a court with the power of judicial review and instructs it to perform judicial review. What the Iraqi court did, though, two years ago is that when faced with the question, is this law consistent with, is a particular law consistent with Islamic principles as the Constitution requires? The court said, I know the Constitution tells me I must resolve this case, and I will not resolve this case because I'm not qualified. And the reason it, it implicitly, and, and, and this I'm borrowing from a colleague of mine, Haider Hamoudi, um, who is Iraqi and, and follows Iraqi. Um, uh, court cases very closely, um, was that in these circumstances, the, the court felt that Iraq had failed to create the conditions under which a court could be trusted. So it did create a minimalist definition of what, what, what Islam was that the state had to respect. So it had done that. But it did not create a court in which all parties felt they were represented. And so it, 
what the court felt that if I give, if I say that the law is consistent with Islam or is not consistent with Islam, the public will not respect my decision. I will lose prestige and that will impair my ability to do anything. So the courts declared the question of whether a law is consistent with Islam a political question, um, or what we would call a political question in, in American um, uh, jurisprudence. Now, the, the question, if I understand, um, it was posed to me as part, why did the court do this? Was the court concerned that it could not give an answer that would satisfy both Shia and Sunnis, or did it, um, or did it worry that it could not give an answer that would satisfy both secularists and Islamists? Is that the question? Well, okay, it's actually, the, I think what we're saying is the exact same thing. The only people who care about what the mujtahids are saying are the Shia. In this court has no Shiite clerics on it. And therefore, when it gave an answer, since it had no Shiite clerics on it, the Shia, it had no mujtahids on the court, nor did it have any, Sh any Shia clerics who could be familiar with what the mujtahids were saying, the court felt anything I say will not be trusted by the Shia. So I think what I'm saying is the same thing. With Sunnis, they don't have this problem because they don't have this hierarchy of authorities. So the Egyptian Supreme Constitutional Court is able to speak on questions of Islamic law because Sunni Islam has essentially lost much of this hierarchical um, relationship with authority. But the Shiites haven't, and therefore this, the court was confident it could give an, ex in, an answer that the Sunnis might accept, but no Shia would accept it if it did not have a cleric on the court. So that, that's my explanation. So I think I agree with you, I just put it in different terms. I, I hope that explains it. <clears throat> Thank you. We close this uh, panel and uh, we'll take uh, uh, 20 minutes uh, Coffee break, so we reconvene at uh, 4.40, okay?